Welcome, Grant, to the show. I'm so excited to have you here. How are you doing today? Doing awesome, Lindsay. Thanks for letting me hang out with you. Fantastic. So guys, on the show today, I'm excited to introduce Grant Baldwin. Grant has been featured on the Inc. 5000 list, Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, and Huffington Post. He is a speaker and author, and he is on a mission to motivate leaders and entrepreneurs to become better public speakers. He is also the host of the Speaker Lab podcast from Nashville, Tennessee. How's life in Nashville, Grant? Life is wonderful. I'm uh, I, I'm married to my high school sweetheart. We got three beautiful daughters, so it's me and a house full of women. So, <laughs> amazing. I, I have no complaints. I'm loving life. <laughs> Sounds like a great life. I love it. I love it. So we're excited to have you here because our listeners they are doing business in English as their second language, mm -hmm. and public speaking to begin with can be quite a challenge for all of us, even in our native language. But for our listeners, we're learning how to do this in English. So you are the authority today on public speaking. Could you start us off with a story of a time when, you know, a speech didn't start out so great for you and how did you turn it around? Do you have any little anecdote for us? Yeah, there's a, you know, anytime that you're giving a presentation, there's a lot of variables and factors that go into it of what makes a talk work, you know, because there's times you may finish and you may feel like that went really well and times where you're like, it was a disaster. So I always remind speakers, there's actually three variables that kind of go into it that we look at. One is going to be you as a speaker, you know, did were you prepared? Were you ready? Did you show up or did you just kind of wing it? Did you just go through the motions, right? So right. maybe a talk didn't go well and and it's really, you know, heavily dependent on you and your part. Maybe a, a, a talk didn't go well, but like you showed up, you brought it, you crushed it, but there are some other variables in play there. So okay. another variable and factor is going to be the audience. Okay. So let me give an example. Let's imagine that um, you're getting ready to speak. Let's say you're speaking to a group of sales professionals and, and, yeah. and sales leaders. And so right before you speak, the, the VP of sales for this company gets up and says, Hey, you know, the, the, the recession is kind of hitting us hard. And unfortunately what we're going to do, we're going to have to lay off half of you. And, mm. uh, but uh, we were going to tell you who the half are that are going to make it and who the half are we're going to have to let go. But for First, we're going to have this speaker. Please welcome Grant. Like, it doesn't matter what you say on stage. Like, nobody's listening to you, right? Uh, right. I remember, so for example, I remember a few years ago, I was speaking in um, uh, in Houston, Texas, and there was a hurricane coming in. And oh, no. this hurricane was supposed to make landfall the next day. And so I'm I'm like giving my all. Everybody's on their phone. Nobody's paying attention. Oh. You know, you're, like making plans and stuff. I'm thinking like, I don't want to be here. I want to get out of here. I, how, do I, how do I get a next flight out? You know? So sure. one of those things where like, it's not going great, but it's like kind of, it's not necessarily my, it's just kind of the environment, right? Right. Another, another variable and factor is going to be uh, the actual setting. Okay. And so here's what I mean by that is uh, I remember a few years ago, I spoke in an event in New Jersey and uh, I remember um, I gave a keynote in a room that set uh, uh, 2000 people and there was about 2000 people in there. So okay. you have a room that seats 2000 people and you have 2000 people in there. It's awesome. Yes. Um, and so right afterwards, they had me do a workshop with about 50 people in the same room. Mm. Well, when you're going to do a, a keynote for a talk in, in front of 2000 people in a room that seats 2000 people, it's awesome. When you do uh, you know, a set, another session for 50 people in a room that sees 2000, it's dead. It's empty. It's horrible. Right. Okay. And so that's another variable where like it was something that was kind of outside of my control. I, I don't want, you want to try to make the room as small as possible, but right. Um, so all that to say, yeah, there's times where like a talk goes great and a time where a talk doesn't go so well, a hurricane may be coming. I remember one time speaking at an event and they were, um, it was at this hotel and they were doing some construction outside of the hotel and the power got cut for the entire hotel. There's no lighting at all. And, uh, this is kind of like between <laughs> sessions and I'm supposed to do a session coming up. And so I had everyone turn on the flashlight on their phone and just hold it up. And there's no mic. There's no, I'm just kind of yelling, you know, into the darkness. It was kind of an Incredible. interior room, no external lighting. Uh huh. Um, Remember one time, like a dog came running into a room and I'm trying to give a talk and the dog's just zipping around the room and nobody's oh paying gosh. attention. I'm watching. So all they say, like crazy things happen as speaker. But I think also like that's part of it. You know, the, those kind of like raw, real moments. Yeah, that's part whether it goes well or doesn't go well. Like that's also part of what makes you a, a better speaker and communicator. OK, so we have to be ready for everything. You've given us a lot of examples of storms and crazy things that happen, especially in places like Houston, Texas. They do get a lot of hurricanes, a lot yep. of crazy things 
things happen, um, or dogs running in, or a, a room that's too small, too big, we can't control these things. So then let's get into then your three tips here, Grant, because I think that we're whether we have the perfect conditions, no dogs, no storms, nothing like that, we're still going to be a little bit nervous. So what are yeah. three things um, that our listeners could do to start to overcome their fear of public yeah. speaking? That is, they say that most people are more afraid of public speaking than death. I don't know if that's actually yeah. just a kind of a false tale, <laughs> yeah. but I know we're all pretty scared of it. So what can we do to get over our fear and work through our fear? Yeah. So I'd say a couple of things. One is to recognize like some of that, that fear uh, is oftentimes mistaken for adrenaline or excitement. And so yeah. you think about like some of the, the biggest key moments in your life where you felt something similar, right? So I think about for me, like when I proposed to my wife or when my daughters were born or, yeah. you know, something where you're just like, whoo, like the blood is, is really pumping. And it's, it's not like, you know, when I, when I was getting ready to propose to my wife, it wasn't feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is going to be a disaster. Right going to reject me. It's like, no, I'm feeling pretty confident here, but there's still like just the excitement or like right before you get on a roller coaster, you know, it's something you're just like, Ooh, all right, I hope this goes well. And there's just, it's an excitement there, but oftentimes we can mistake that for the nerves and the, the feeling of just like, oh, this is horrible. And my, you know, I feel nervous. Therefore I shouldn't do this. Like, no, no, it's just, it's kind mm -hmm. of an excitement. And oftentimes we, it's kind of like the body's way of reminding us like, Hey, Hey, heads up. Like, this is important. Like, this is a big deal. Like focus Something in important. Here, you know? Yeah. So it's so like feeling that is not a bad thing. Like mm -hmm. I've given hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of presentations and I still feel some of those nerves. I still feel some of those butterflies and adrenaline and anxiety. And that's, that's not a bad thing. Right. So the question then is kind of number two, like how do you control it? How do you make sure it's not debilitating and it's not really like crushing you? So one thing I would say would be that uh, to really spend the time to practice and prepare mm. the best speakers on the planet. Don't just like scribble some ideas on a napkin and like hop up and I'm just going to wing it. And I just hope it all works together. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that. Like, they really spend a lot of time going over their talk and thinking it through. And so you think about like in other industries or fields, you know, whether you are a professional athlete or a musician, you know, you think like, oh, they're just, you know, they're naturally athletic and they just mm -hmm. hop up on the, on the court or the field or whatever, and they just do their thing and it all just works out. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's like some level of like natural athleticism, but also they spent hours and hours and literally years training and practicing and going over plays and drills right. and, and in the right. weight room to prepare so that it looks like it's natural and it's just kind of flowing out on the field or the court or wherever it may be. But really it's so much work behind the scenes yeah. that led up to kind of that natural feeling that, that starts to come across. So I think like really spending the time behind the scenes, practicing and preparing uh, goes a long way as well. Mm. Um, and then the third thing I would say, uh, and then we can kind of jump off wherever you want here. Sure. As I think, especially for this audience, I think it's really easy to overthink about any um, uh, accent that you may have or tone that you may have or mm -hmm. feel self-conscious of what if people, you know, what if it sounds weird to an audience and, and what if people mm -hmm. don't fully understand what I'm saying? You know, sometimes I'll talk with someone here in the U.S. who has like a, a real Southern accent and they got, sure. they just kind of got a little twang to them, you know, and they're, yeah. they're just, they're kind of just worried about like, well, you know, right. is, is that going to be off-putting to an audience? And so one thing that that's good to remember is that as a human, uh, you are talking to a collection of other humans. And so act like a human, right? And yeah, so like uh, I, I think sometimes we feel like in order to be a speaker, you have to be like overly polished and overly right. robotic. And, Perfect. And like, a, like a yeah. god or something, right? Which is not yeah. the case, you know, like right. you're a person talking to other people. So act like a human. So when a dog comes running in the room, laugh mm -hmm. about it. It's not the end of the world, you know, it, it, make a make a joke about it or whatever it may be. Yeah. Uh, and so if, if I think that the key is like, make sure if you have some type of accent or something, make sure you enunciate so that people can at least understand you. Mm -hmm. Make sure that, that, that what you're saying, that you're speaking at a pace or cadence where people can understand what you're saying. And so a, a, an accent of any kind is great. It's endearing as long as people can still understand what you're saying. Exactly. If you get to a point where people can't understand you, mm -hmm. then it becomes a little bit more challenging because they're like, I don't, I don't even know what the message is here, right? And so uh. they just start to check out. So lean into the accent, lean into your own personality there, make sure you speak at a pace and with an enunciation that people can still understand you. But again, those, those, um, uh, um, like characteristics of how you speak and communicate, which may mm -hmm. sound different than someone else. It's okay. Those are like endearing, yes. like normal human things. So, so certainly lean into that. Right. And in that case, we, we go back to the preparation because we know, you know there's a reason why we're actually presenting on this topic. It's because we are experts 
on this topic, whatever we're talking about for our listeners, right? And so coming back to that and remembering that, what strikes me about these tips, Grant, is interesting. It's a lot of what works in public speaking. It sounds like it's what works in one-on-one conversation as well. It's being human. And I love your first tip about raw energy. You know, this idea, we automatically make it a bad thing. Right? When we're about to get on stage, we feel that energy and we think there's something wrong right now. Yeah. But what if we thought, actually, that's my that's my power, right? That's my energy. That's really? what's going to make this speech amazing. And I love how then we take it into the preparation. Mm-hmm. So good. So good. Uh, anything else? I mean, so basically you've gone through them. I mean, this is it, guys. I mean, make sure that you relabel your energy in your mind as good. Consider that a good sign lean on preparation. And for our listeners, we're going to want to spend even more time preparing than if we were going to give this speech in our native language, right, Grant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because again, it's something that um, you you want to feel confident in. And like, uh, let me give an example. Let's say, um, if you think back to like uh, high school or college or university, and you remember the days of like taking a, a quiz or an exam or a test yes. or something like that, like you have a choice. You could kind of show up and be like, yeah, I'm just going to, you know, I sat in through class and kind of listened to some lectures and sort of paid attention. So I didn't. And I'm just going to kind of go through the motions and we'll see how the test goes. Right. Or it's like, I'm really going to spend the time to, I'm going to go over my notes. I'm going to practice. I'm going to review. Um, I'll give an example. I'm actually living this right now. So this is a total random side note, but uh, I have been, I've always thought it'd be cool to get my pilot's license. Oh, and so for the past, cool. like seven months, I've been working towards this. Well, tomorrow, actually, as we record this tomorrow, I have a big exam with the FAA, uh, like a written test. And it's like, it's been years since I've like studied for a written test. Well, well I got Ooh. a stack of books over here and papers I've been like studying and reviewing. So when I go tomorrow, like 24 hours from now and sit down to take this exam, like, I'm going to feel confident because yes. like I've done the work I've practiced, I've, I've put it in. And so again, there's still maybe some butterflies like, all right, this is a big test. This is important. You know, you mm-hmm, spent a lot mm-hmm. of time getting ready for this, but it's kind of similar to like when we were talking about from like a sports analogy standpoint, like you think the guys that play the Super Bowl aren't nervous. Well, of course they're not. like that excitement, the adrenaline, like, but they've played hundreds and hundreds of football games, you know, but exactly. this is a, a big deal. So it's not like, oh my gosh, I feel butterflies. I feel excitement. I feel adrenaline. Therefore I shouldn't do this or I'm not ready. It's like, no, no, like you've put in the work to be ready. Right. That's what you need. You show, up, That's... you show up and do the thing. Yeah. I love it. It's so good. That is the final force of energy that you need to put your skills into action at that point. Isn't it Grant? Yeah. So good. And I think on the, just to the opposite side of things, you know, the raw energy shows up, we're about to go on stage and let's say there's a scenario where we actually don't know the material or haven't mm-hmm. prepared. I think in that case, that's where it's de- detrimental. That's where we might ha- have our mind go blank or we might get really no- nervous and stumble and kind of mess up the speech. Would you agree? I mean, that's how it can go in the yeah. wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. And let me give you two quick thoughts on that. One is that, um, uh, that, when you when you have you just kind of like draw a blank or something like there's been times i remember i remember one time i was was speaking and doing like a workshop or something and i just draw a blank i don't remember what we were talking about (laughs) or what the story was i just completely lose my train of thought which again happens it happens so you know one thing is like you can panic and become nervous and and, um uh, but i remember like i remember just talking to a lady in the front row and i was just like what was i talking about (laughs) and it just and, and it's important to remember like the audience takes their cues from you And so if something's not a big deal to you, it's not a big deal to them, right? But if all of a sudden I get uncomfortable, then they're just like, ooh, like it makes you as an audience member feel like, oh, this is painful to watch, you know? Yes. It's no big deal to me. It's no big deal to them, right? So realize that like as the speaker, like you set the tone. And if you forget something, like again, act like a human and just make a joke about it. Like I totally lost my train of thought. All right, let's talk about something different. So that'd be one thought. Another thought real quick is that, um, that I think sometimes with a speech specifically, is that we feel like I uh, I have to get things in the exact right order and I have mm. to say things exactly this, the, mm-hmm. a certain way. But remember, it's not like the audience has a script where they're following along and they're like, ooh, you said that wrong or ooh, you did that out of order or you missed a line. Like if you are... Uh, if you're singing the national anthem for your country and uh, you mess up the lyrics, everybody there knows because they know sure. what the lyrics are supposed to be, right? Sure. Mm-hmm. But if you're giving a speech and you know you do the thing, you do points out of order, or you forget a story, or you tell a story later, or you just forget the key line, 
Nobody knows. They don't know. Nobody has any idea. Nobody's following along and like, keeping track of these things. So again, you said you you uh, you are like the 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 uh, thermostat for the room, and mm. if, like, it's no big deal to you, and you just keep going on. Nobody knows anything different. Right. And then you can decide how and when or whether to tie that piece back in that you may have left behind because it totally. comes back to your connection with the audience. I feel I love how this, again, ties in with one on one conversation. It works for speeches, guys. Giving a presentation or a speech is not a whole other world, a whole new set of skills we have to learn. Yes, there are some skills, but the basic principles come back to using your energy, being prepared and connecting. So good, Grant. This is fantastic. So where can our listeners listeners find what you're up to online, your podcast, your website, your book, so they can learn more from you. Yeah. Everything we do is over at thespeakerlab.com, thespeakerlab.com. We have a, a podcast by the same name, the Speaker Lab Podcast. We've got over 400 episodes there on all things related to, you know, creating a talk, presenting a talk, uh, but also related to like, you know, finding and booking gigs and what do you speak about and how much do you charge and who hires speakers and how does that mysterious world work? Uh, a lot about international speaking as well. So a lot of great stuff there. You mentioned the book, um, The Successful Speaker, Five Steps for Booking Gigs, Getting Paid, Building Your Platform. So it walks through a five-step process on exactly what we teach as far as like, if you wanted to book gigs, if you wanted to speak, whether you want to speak, you know, five times a year or a hundred times a year, it walks through the framework and the practical steps that you need to take to be able to define a book gigs and to earn an income uh, through your through your message. So, uh, yeah, everything we do is at thespeakerlab.com. Fantastic. I'm going to check out that book because I would like to start booking more speaking engagements about podcasting. So for our listeners, guys, if you have a topic that you're an expert on and you feel the world needs to hear your message, check out what Grant has at the podcast, the book, and get started, right? This is the time. Don't look back with regret on what we haven't done five years from now. Go for it. So good. Grant, thanks for coming on the show. It's been awesome having a little chat with you today. Thanks, Lindsay. Appreciate it. Take care. <laughs>